I greet you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad that the Lord could give me this opportunity as her daughter to bring his word to his sons and daughters. In other words, we are a family. And I praise the Lord for this opportunity. And I know because you came, you will be blessed. Um, in the last one month, uh, in the midweek services especially, we have been thematic. And we have um, concentrated on the man. Remember, I started by saying we are a family. And in, on, in midweek services, majority of us, I don't see us there, but you can follow us. The, all the messages are online. We have been focusing on the man as the head of a family. He is very key. He is on divine appointment. And last Sunday, Pastor Sikuku took us through a very powerful message on where are the fathers. And this morning, I would want just to pick one more aspect on the same theme about fathers. The Bible does not contradict itself. I want to talk about silence, but on the negative. I know that in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 7, it talks about there is a time for everything, a time to speak and a time to keep silent. Now the danger is when you exchange the two. You speak when you're supposed to be silent, or you are silent when you're supposed to be speaking. And that is why we need to depend on the Holy Spirit so that he can prompt you when to shut your mouth and when to speak out. Because when you don't do either of the two when you're supposed to do, God does not hold us innocent. And I want us to share in the next few minutes on the topic, when the men kept silent. When the men kept silent. And in this case, they kept silent when they were supposed to speak. But maybe we should start off by God always shares expectations. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. And I want to lead in uh, NIV. And I'll ask the media to project for us in Amplified. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instructions of the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Now you guess why I, I wanted us to read in Amplified. You, you heard that difficult word, ex, ex, exasperate. It's saying, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by showing favorism or indifference to any of them, but bring, bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I like the Amplified because it has really elaborated what it means to provoke. In other words, the verse brings out what should be done and what should not be done. Provoking to anger. Annoy, make angry. Being unreasonable, humiliating, abusive, showing favorizing, being indifferent, all this, we have been asked not to do that. Those are instructions to the fathers. But instead, they have given, the Bible gives us what we are supposed to do or what the fathers are supposed to do. To bring up the children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Maybe you are here and now you have already switched me off. Because you are not a father, you are not a man, the word of God is very gender sensitive. The word of God will be relevant to you. Even if you are to go gender-wise, I see fathers 
and I see prospective fathers, yes, just about to be manifested. If I was single, I would say amen. If I were a single man, you know, you know, you might say now it's, they are talking about fathers. I'm not yet a father. It's just a matter of time and you'll be manifested in Jesus name. In other words, God has an expectation. And I want to read a, a, a story I came across the confession of a father. My family and I were traveling on the highway from a whole week at the Sunday coast beaches. My wife was driving and I was to her left leading the newspaper. I looked up occasionally at the highway in front of us. It occurred to me our car was inching too close to the right edge. The shoulder of the road did not join with the highway, but where the concrete added, there was a drop off of at least six inches. I should have been alarmed and should have alerted my wife. You would have thought this was happening to someone else. I sat there watching the highway, thinking the car's wheels are getting uncomfortably close to the edge. Our three children were in the back seat. All our lives were at risk, and I did nothing. Suddenly, the wheels dipped over the edge. The car went into a spin on that two-lane highway while we were traveling at 100 kilometers per hour. That light front tire blew out. We spun around several times and came to a rest in our rain, facing opposite direction. Our youngest son called out, what's happening, what's happening, as the car went into the whirlwind. A man ran out of, the, of a house across the road to check on us. What he said scared me even worse than the experience. He said, while you were in that tailspin, an 18 wheel passed on the other side. You came that close to all being dead now. We pushed the car off the highway, changed the spare wheel, then drove to the next petrol station where we bought a new tire and went on our way. The husband's sirens, or passivity for that matter, costed the whole family a lot of anxiety, money, and a near-death experience. Just an example of when this father or this husband should have warned the wife or should have spoken and they would have avoided that. And that's why I started by saying, knowing when to speak and when to keep silent. And this morning, I want us to look very briefly on two men that chose to be silent when they were supposed to be speaking. And I want to start with the very first man in the Bible, and that is Adam. And I would want us to read from the, from the book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate. And I want you to mark the last part of that. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Project for us, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. 
This was a con where we have just led was a conversation between the serpent and the woman. God had given instructions to Adam even before the woman was created. Yet, Adam seems to have just enjoyed the conversation between the serpent and the woman, and he decided to say nothing. If anything, he took the fruit and ate. Back to our reading. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. I want you to note here, Adam was hearing or listening to the conversation. As the serpent tries, negotiates with Eve, that they will not die. He is the one who had received the instructions, yet he remained silent. Verse 21 of the same chapter 2, verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's lips and then closed up the place with fresh. What I'm trying to bring out is where we read in verse um, 16 and 17 is where the man is getting the instructions. The woman, Eve, has, is nowhere in the scene. Actually, she has not yet been created. And he's been created in verse 21. Yet Adam stood there, listened to the conversation as they negotiated. He was so passive, he never interrupted, he never corrected, he decided to keep silent. He chose to be silent all through the conversation. The Bible says he was there. After eat, eating, she gave him. He ate and still remained silent. This became the turning point of the human race because the man said nothing. Death entered. Well, we are not sure whether Eve would have reasoned he was, if she was corrected, but there is no record that he attempted. You will not be held responsible when you have prayed your part. It becomes the responsibility of the one who is receiving the correction if they do not. Just like the Bible says that when you witness, when you tell people about the saving grace of Jesus Christ and people make the choice of not saying yes to Jesus, you are not responsible. In this case, Adam would not be, be taken responsible for that. God uses protocol. He knew, he gave the instructions to Adam. But when he came to ask them what has happened, he never addressed Eve. He called Adam and asked, where are you? It is because God will hold you accountable to the responsibility he has given you. God will hold you accountable to the assignment he has given you. If you decide to delegate it to the other person because you think they look more able than you, God will ignore that. God ignored. Are you sure he didn't see Eve negotiating with the serpent? But when he came for accountability, he confronted Adam. When Adam decided to be silent when he should have been speaking. And I want to bring to us this morning that you have received the word of God. God expects you to be the person, to be the difference. Wherever you find God being ridiculed, when you keep silent, God holds you accountable. The Bible says that we are the right of the world. The Bible says we are the salt of the world. We are the ones, we are sons and daughters of impact. People should know a Christian lives around here. Because you would stand there silent and watch things going out of heart. God will not hold you innocent. The Bible says that these stories were put in the Bible that they may be examples and they may teach us on how we should improve on our behaviors. This morning, when you're looking around and you watch people misbehaving, 
Whether in your home or where you work and you decide to keep silent, God will not hold you innocent. When men decided to be silent, and maybe we'll dwell on this other second man. And this is the man we find in the book of 2 Samuel. The story starts from chapter 2 up to chapter 4, but we'll just read a few verses. And this is the high priest, Eri. Eri was a high priest in Israel for 40 years. He was a man of God. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 17. We are going to read all the way up to 24. 1 Samuel 2, 17 up to 24. First Samuel chapter 2. Let's read 22. First Samuel 2, 22. Now Eri was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with women who served at the entrance to the tent of meetings. Continue. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. Verse 25. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. The background of this story is where that in Israel, a high priest was allowed to bring his sons because they are in the right age of priesthood. But where we have read, we have read about some wicked sons, sons of Eri, the high priests. And he still decided to bring them, and they became priests in Israel. Unfortunately, the Bible calls them wicked. They were not only um, sleeping with women at the, tent of, at the entrance of the tent of meetings, they were also extortioning meat, which was being brought by people sacrificing to the Lord. And Eri seems so casual. Verse 23 says, So he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons. The report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. I want you to note that Eli was a good man. He, was, he had a very prestigious position, a high priest, and for 40 years. Eri was a good mentor. We all know, or most of us are familiar with the story, the way he mentored the young boy Samuel until he became a great prophet in Israel. He even taught Samuel how to distinguish the voice of God and how to respond. And it actually happened. He was a good man, according to the world standards. He was not a wicked man. He made impact at the temple. For example, even before Samuel, actually Samuel was answered prayer. He spoke to the wife of Hannah. When Hannah came crying, and Eric confronted her and told her to go in peace, Hannah went home and got baby Samuel. And the Bible says that Elkanah and Hannah kept on coming to Shiro year after year. And he could prophesy to their lives. And the Bible says he, he prophesied until Elkanah and Hannah were blessed with three sons and two daughters apart from Samuel. He was a good prophet. He was a good man. He was a good pastor. Very good, but in the temple. 
But when it came to Eli with his sons, he had a problem. At the temple, he was okay. But with his sons, now that where there was a problem. It looks like Eli lacked courage to confront and discipline his sons. Remember where we ran? We read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 4, that fathers, they were told what not to do and what to do, to discipline and teach their children in the ways of the Lord. But in this case, it looks like Eli was selectively silent to some extent. He was very naive. He was very passive. He was not ready to confront his sons and put his foot down as a father. He decided to turn a bright eye. Actually, he can be accused of parental neglect. Because now, you are serving with your sons. And then, let me just give this example. For example, we are talking about the bishop. He has got two sons. One called Mungai, the other one called Victor. He's inside here, but the reports he's getting from us are very... And then you come Sunday after Sunday, and he has done nothing about it. At least he can remove them, isn't it? If he's, they are doing such wicked things at the entrance of the tent of the meetings, God had an expectation that early there was something he could do. And I want you to know, when God allows you to see, to be a witness of some of these things, he has an expectation from you because you are a believer. I loved the way Pastor Millicent has says the opportunity. Because we don't want to turn a bright eye when Zimmerman is being broadcasted for the wrong reasons. Children trafficking. We stand and say, no, in Jesus' name. And it looks like God had an expectation that there is something more that Eric could do apart from just telling them, my sons, what I'm hearing is very bad. Now why are you doing like this? It looks when he came to discipline, his voice came down. When he came to blessing the other people like Elkanah and Hannah, he was forthright. Go in peace and may the Lord reward you. And he did, God did it. If he did it at home, I can assure you, it would have happened. And to show that God was not satisfied with Eri's reaction, 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 13. Three thirteen. First Samuel chapter 3, 13. For I told him, this is God, for I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. God expected Eli to restrain his sons from the wicked behavior. Eli knew about it. He failed. He refused. He turned a bright eye. He was casual. Later on, you discover he became a casualty of the whole event. Actually, 1 Samuel 2, 27 to 36, we'll read very quickly. 2, 27 to 36. God was not satisfied with Eri's behavior. So he sent him a man. He warned him. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors, family, when they were in Egypt at a pharaoh? I chose your ancestor out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an effort in my presence. I also gave your ancestors, family, all the food offerings presented by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice? An offering that I prescribed for my dwelling. Why do you honor your sons more than me? By fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people. Hold it there. It is his sons who are doing that. But when God sends a prophet to Eri, he takes it personal. He is talking to Eri and telling, why do you scorn my sacrifice? 
the sons were taking meat from the people by force. And God didn't take it kindly. Why do you honor your sons more than me? By fattening yourselves on the choice of parts of every offering made by my people Israel. Is that a word that later on, when Eri is dying, the Bible says that he was very fat, he was very big. He was fattening himself according to the prophet. Let's continue. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be dis disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age. And you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength. And all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed or raised. God is now sending. People had said word to Eri. He did nothing. Now God gives Eri another chance. And he says to him a prophet. And he, he, it is revealed what will happen. But we don't see whatever Eri did. He told your two sons will die on the same day. We don't see him interceding for his sons. We know God could have reverted that. We all know Ezekiel. When he was told he will die, the Bible says he went back to God, turned against the wall, and appealed the case. When God gives you an opportunity to appeal, you better appeal. But we don't see Eri appearing the case, even after receiving this prophecy. And as if that was not enough. Chapter 3, verse 11, 17, and then 17 to 18. After this prophet has left, God still gave Samuel another chance. Not Samuel, Eri, another chance. First Samuel 3, 11. The, the, the background of this, this verse is where Samuel kept on sleeping and he, he would hear the voice. But he didn't know it was God. And he was helped actually by Eri. Kube, the message was about Eri. That's what is happening at this scene. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. Um, okay. And at that time, I will carry out against Eri everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eri, the guilt of Eri's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Continue. Seventeen. Project verse seventeen. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, and they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Verse eighteen. But Samuel, no. Let's get up to seventeen. The Lord, people came and told Eri. He seems to have just heard and did a very passive warning. Then a prophet was sent to Eri. He did nothing. Now the Lord is sending Samuel again. And we all, we all read in verse, uh, what was it he said to you? Eri asked. Do not hide it from me. 
May God deal with you, be it ever so severe, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. This was Eli's response. After all the warnings, you know, a very easy response. God is giving him an opportunity to do an appeal. Let him do very easy response. And very quickly, I want us to see the consequences of his passivity. The consequences of him being silent and not speaking out even after the many warnings. Because of time, we will not read. But later on, as you go to chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, you can read it at home. Eh? That Israel well into a war with the Philistines. The Bible says 4,000 soldiers were killed. And because they lost in battle and they were not used at this season losing in battle, they decided to go for the Ark of, uh, the Ark of Covenant from Shiloh and bring it here so that they may go and fight the Philistines. And in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 14, Eri heard the outcry and asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eri, who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. He told Eri, I've just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eri asked, what happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Verse 18. When he, when he mentioned the ark of God, Eri fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for he was an old man, and he was heavy. He had read Israel 40 years. Verse 19. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into Reba and gave birth, but was overcome by her Reba pains. As she was dying, the woman attending her said, Don't despair. You have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. I want you to note this. Eli had received enough time to respond and act differently. He decided and chose to be silent, to turn a bright eye, to make crazy responses. Like maybe some of us, you can say, you see, atafudishwa na urimwengu. Can you be the urimwengu? At least you carry the word of hope. You can bring hope to that person. Don't wait. Because of doing that, a few, there were several disasters that happened. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. 30,000. Remember, soldiers were men, meaning 30,000 families had no head of the family because of what maybe could have been, who could have been averted. Consequence number two. Eri's both sons who had accompanied the ark of God were killed in that battle. Eli, their father, age 98, died. Eli's expectant daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, went into labor and died. And as if that was not enough, just before she died, she named her son Ichabod, a very negative legacy. The glory has departed. Why did this happen? Eli and his sons dishonored God. And then, in this case, God also did not fight for them. When you dishonor God, the presence of God departs, and you keep on rusting because God will not fight for you. We read earlier, when you honor God, he honors you. When you honor God, he fights for you. Eli decided 
to honor his sons. It seems like he was enjoying the fatty meat he used to receive from the sons. And no wonder he's rebuked to them. What I hear you are doing is very bad. Look so shallow. He doesn't look to have minded the kind of meat he used to receive. And let me tell you, it looks like the devil took them so far that they were prepared to go. And cost Eli to pay so much than he could afford. Because he even paid for it with his own life. Remember, from the word go, he had been told, your sons will die in one day. Is it a wonder, if you read this story, when they, he heard that the ark had been, uh, had, uh, they have gone, the ark has gone, he went to wait at the road. You know he knew. He knew what God had already told him. And when he heard the word ark, it has been taken away. He just collapsed. You are silence will cause, will bring frustration. Even the men listening to me, when you put a bright eye in your family, you are just watching, saying nothing, just to say, tell God, tell them your responsibility, you are clean. When you keep silent, you will end up having frustrations, dead dreams, stored destinies, because fathers carry destiny for their children. A son needs maybe just one affirmation and they are able to arise. A daughter, one affirmation from a father or from a mother and they move on. My prayer for us this morning is that God will give you wisdom to know when to keep silent and when to speak. But I can tell you this one for sure. The Bible is very clear on when you should speak. We, we sing a song, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. We are soldiers of the cross. Even when you, there is danger, stand up for the cross. I said I was talking about men who decided to be silent when they should have spoken. Adam decided to be silent and just watch the drama of the serpent and the, and the wife. As they negotiate about issues, he was the first third recipient of the instructions. It brought death to the whole human race. Eric decided to keep silent. He died. His sons died. That thousand soldiers died. The ark of God was taken captive. His daughter-in-law died. I pray that no one will die because of your silence. No one should die when you have the medicine. We should be so keen to point people to God who has the solution. And I want to speak to the men whom the Bible says that they are the head. If we were to look at the human body, the physical human body. The head is at the top. And the head carries the brain. And it has, the brain has the best, best interest of all the parts of the body. The head carries the eyes. When it sees danger for one part of the body, for example, the head sees that the right hand is about to brush against a hot stove. It sends a message to that body part with an urgent command to get out of there. And God has such an expectation to all the heads listening to me this morning. You see danger? You should announce the warning. The father is the head and should play this role even in the family. We have been studying this month of June about the man being the leader the protector, the provider, and the priest. And it looks like Eli had an issue on being the priest. Adam had an issue of being the priest. And what does the priest do? He brings God into the scene and possessions God in his family and makes God central center of the family. 
A passive head is one that sees danger and does nothing. One that knows trouble is just ahead and goes back to sleep. How I pray that no head will sleep, go to sleep. You are seeing danger and you just decide to ignore the will of God. He has already, at he, it has already been, been drawn. At the map, Ikogani, you are partnering with God. You can appeal to God. You are a son. You are a daughter. You can appeal. Practice tough love. Make someone mad if it means benefiting them or even saving their lives. Above everything else, seek to do that which is approved and it pleases God. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. There is a call there. That there is, it is possible to know the approved will of God. And the will of God is that all of us may not perish, but have eternal life. I want to, I'm calling upon us to have active living. Don't turn a bright eye when you should be giving hope. How I pray that we'll all make, make a resolution to make everybody a prisoner of hope. When you live in hope, you will dance even when there is no music. Prisoners of hope. Speaking it out because it is God, not you. When you speak God's word and not your word, God follows his word and he will perform it. You just do your part. You don't have to shout. You just shine. I pray that the fathers, the men listening to me, and the women listening to me will intentionally mentor their children, involve them in what they are doing, and be part of their life journey. That is God's expectation for each one of us. There is that person who looks up on you, and you know the way. God expects you, because you are the one who has the solution, to give out and reach out, give a hand, become part of the journey, and God will bless your effort because he wants us to be his spokesperson. Are you willing to be God's voice, God's extended hands, God in the marketplace, God at home? You will not be so good here in church, yet at home you are silent. That shall not be your portion. Ellie seems to have been vocal in church. He was blessing people and they were being blessed. Destinies were being changed. But at home with his sons. And incidentally, I kept on asking myself as I read that story. I never came across Mrs. Eddie. Now I don't know where she was. But wherever she was, the prophecy had talked about the whole family. When you keep quiet, you will endanger yourself and the rest of your family members. Your voice will change you, will save you, and change your family. Be God's mouthpiece. And you will have taken care of your family. I would want us to pray. Remember I said, wherever you are, God expects you to speak out when it is necessary to speak. And especially when they are blaspheming God and you are just seated there, he doesn't take it lightly. And I want to pray for each one of us that we'll have that courage to speak out and address the evil and invoke the name of God and God will come and make the difference. If you want us to make that prayer together, because we all need God, I want you to lift up your hands if you want to be part of that prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to pray for the people raising up their hands. Praying that, Lord, you make us courageous to stand out for you. Make us courageous 
to own that which you have given us. You will hold us accountable. I am praying that God, you will give us that spirit of courage. Your word tells us that you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of courage and sound mind. I pray that that will be our portion this morning. We'll speak out what you expect us to and show men and women the way. May you do this, Lord, because you have promised to answer every prayer. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you.